Hey everybody, David Chang here with The Art of Thinking Smart, where we're learning to live smarter lives for tomorrow. I'm very excited today for our guest, Samantha Wasserman, and over the past 20 years, she's worked as an executive coach for Fortune 500 executives, as well as startup entrepreneurs in a wide variety of industries, and I got lucky where she's been serving as my coach, and I just thought that this is a perfect opportunity to kind of share and, and showcase some of her skills. So Samantha, thank you so much for coming to the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, David. All right, and, and we're uh, live on Skype right now and, and excited to be able to talk with you. And, and I just wanted to kind of give you a few minutes to just talk about your career and how you got into executive coaching. And I like the title, Talent Management. When I think of talent management, I think of you know Hollywood, but this is where nowadays in today's economy, we have to be watching our talent and who we hire and what we develop. Right. Yeah. So um, as for the brief career history, I started out um, like many people do uh, from at least the, the Gen X generation where I looked at my parents and I sort of got familiar with what they knew how to do. Right. They were lawyers. And, and I went into a career thinking that I was going to be a lawyer. Um, but what I found along the way is that I really loved consulting and I really loved solving problems and I really loved things of a human interest. But um, after a while, I realized that uh, I didn't necessarily want to practice law. So I sort of took a detour and got a business degree rather than a law degree. And um, from there, I just came out doing consulting work in what I think is called now human capital management consulting. And that involved a whole lot of things, organization development, organization effectiveness, compensation, how do you best manage the performance of your employees, and that sort of blossomed in a variety of roles to, to lead me where I am now as an executive coach. Oh, well, that's great, and, and I really appreciate it. I've learned a lot, and I recommend that anybody who wants to advance their career should consider talking to one simply because you know we don't have, we have our blind spots I know for a fact you've helped me recognize my own and, and I wanted to talk today about for somebody you know who's who's trying to advance their career in the workplace just getting in starting a second career or even those that are kind of eh, a few years from retirement what is this single most important skill or skills you would say is is very important for somebody to have well um that's a great question um at any given point in one's career if i were able to identify one or two skills uh i would say resilience would be mm. one of them and critical problem solving would yeah. be the other um, I think that if, I, if I'm thinking about someone who's in the early stages of their, their career, what employers really look for is people that can come up with innovative ways to solve problems. That's what they want to see. Um, because the technology is getting so innovative in terms of the, the more... Um, the more mundane and tactical things that can be taken care of by software programs, they're looking really for human ingenuity. And the more people shine in that area, the more people are gonna stand out. I also think that expertise cannot be underrated at all. And so when you're talking about people that are in more mature stages of their career, how they approach problem solving and how they're able to quickly eliminate solutions that don't have any sustainability or, or commercial viability is very important. Um, and that as long as they're approaching problem solving and teaching others how to critically problem solve, I would say that those two things are, are incredibly important. Um, as far as resilience, we all need resilience. As a coach, I see people get in and out. Some of the most successful business people I know have had really tough times, which is what makes them successful, quite frankly. And resilience is something that gets built over time uh, with, with a lot of trial and error and, quite frankly, a lot of failure. And it's a skill that, that nothing else can really replace. Oh, that's great. I, I, it's comforting to hear that the most <laughs> successful people uh, you have coached is through failure that they get stronger. And I always try to remind myself through my failures, you know, great people have to accomplish or overcome great obstacles. So, uh, you know, for somebody who is maybe, let's say, 
questioning their career field or looking for a career change. I, I recently read a statistic that, you know, our parents, grandparents' generations would stay in one career, 30 plus years. Mm -hmm. The average millennial switching job every two years, two and a half, and they said they'll have 10 to 15 careers throughout their lifetime. What are the pros and cons of that? And if somebody likes that type, what would you say to them to you know, develop and enhance their skills? Well, it's interesting. I spent the majority of my professional coming of age, if you will, in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I'm quite, during the dot-com era, and I'm quite familiar with the switching of jobs. Um, the one, I'll start with the, the cons, and then we'll, we'll switch over to the pros. Um, from an organizational perspective and, and the, the, what the global economy demands in terms of our managers and leaders, um, switching jobs every couple of years is detrimental to someone's development. The reason why is if you think about long-term strategy um, and you think about how you hold people accountable for results, that's really important in, in any individual who's aspiring to be a leader or a manager in their growth process. You can't just go and, and, and sit in a job for 18 months and leave and then all of a sudden expect five years later, repeat that pattern and expect five years later to be a, um, a good manager because you really probably haven't been accountable for results that are sustainable. So that's, that's an issue from a talent management perspective, which I know that we'll speak to later. Mm. One of the pros is that I think that people in this generation, a lot of the millennials, will get a lot of exposure to a lot of different types of managers. So um, as you brought up back in the day, if you were working at GE, GE went out and they selected a certain type of leader that they wanted to season and, and grow within the company and it created a certain type of culture. Well, employees today get to experience a whole range of cultures and a whole range of types of people. And I think that's good from an exposure perspective. And I think it's good from a, a breadth perspective, but it's not great for a depth perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, that's great. I, and I definitely, as an entrepreneur, uh, I, instead of just switching job to job, I just start companies and then from there see what happens. Uh, so I think, you know, that that, uh, that I have that entrepreneurial bug in me. And coming from that vantage point, let's say that you are in a job position or you've started your own company. Uh, you know, training is extremely important. And for, for me, I like to read, I like to learn. I, you know, went back to school for my MBA. Uh, let's say a company, doesn't have the training program needed, how can somebody do what they, you know, what, what can they do to prepare for tomorrow's economy? Because things are moving so quickly. And I recently, you know, had to let somebody go just because a particular position needed, you know, Microsoft Office skills. And well, we thought they that person had it, but turned out not as what we thought it was. And technology is really important. So how would you coach somebody through that to, be on top of the game, even if the company doesn't have the resources? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I work with companies all sizes. Um, some are globally based and have a global reach of hundreds of thousands of employees and, and all the way down to a, a client that I worked with just earlier today that only has 14 employees and is a technology company here in Los Angeles. Um, and what I would say is some of the smaller companies um, that don't have the resources are ill-equipped to, to provide formal training and formal mentorship programs. So I would say the best thing for someone in that situation to do is to take the initiative. And, um, and perhaps if there's no formal training, find yourself a mentor. Find someone that you admire. Mm. Um, and you may not like the person. You may not necessarily find their style appealing. But if they have successes and if they are effective at what they do, approach them, have a conversation, try to schedule a quarterly lunch or coffee with them to try to get a mentoring relationship going. That's probably one of the best things that you can do. Another thing that you can do um, is ask people to provide you with some 360 feedback. Sometimes organizations are large enough that they have a resource uh, dedicated to, to human resources or learning development. Other times they don't. But you can even self-initiate that uh, through an email process 
just by saying I'd really like some feedback and I'd like to call on some particular colleagues to give me that feedback just for my own development purposes. And if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to be able to follow up with, with questions and I would appreciate the, your being candid with me um, in both my strengths and things that I can do better. I think those two things are, are very wise things to start with. Got it. And, and uh, kind of on that note, uh, Right now, unemployment ha has been on a decline, and what we're seeing is, uh, at least where I'm at, it's difficult to hire, uh, uh, you know, qualified people at times for mm -hmm. certain positions. So, is it something where you hire somebody who has a skill set, or try to hire somebody that can develop into it? Uh, what, what do you kind of see? I know it depends on person to person, but I think every employer has that struggle of of how do I fill that talent gap and and at what point do I outsource what point do I hire in-house what do you generally kind of your your rules of thumb that you you have well it's interesting that you ask this because I do have clients that um, try to try to assess their organizations um, without getting actual expertise on on skills and capabilities need, needs for the future because I think people often leaders often think in immediate terms and they go out they know that there's a void they have um, a pain point and then they, they try to fill the pain point they end up with more people than they actually need oftentimes um, oftentimes it's difficult for them to screen for what they actually want and it's worthwhile to take a step back and get a strategic picture of where the organization is going in the next two to three years and really understand the capabilities. It's not just the skills that you need, but the capabilities. Um, so, so earlier we were sort of talking about the value of human ingenuity and the ability to figure out creative problem solving. Um, that's something that gets developed over time. It's not something that you can take a class necessarily for. So I think that when um, employers are looking to hire people and looking to fill the void, they shouldn't just go with the pain point. They should really take a solid step back, look at where their organization is going in the next two to three years, and think about the capabilities that are needed for either growth, mm. downsizing, whatever it is. Um, and, and try to get some expertise to, to help them out thinking through what that talent looks like because I, I see all too often companies making mishires or they feel that they're getting uh, product A and they're actually getting product B uh, and it can be hard to, to reabsorb people that don't have the right skill sets in an organization and then you have to unfortunately let them go. Got it and, and I do want to get back to this topic but we have to take a break right now uh, so thank you very much Samantha we're talking about how people can prepare for the future in today's economy and tomorrow's economy uh, we'll see you right back after our break you're watching think tech Hawaii 25 talk shows by 25 dedicated hosts every week helping us to explore and understand the issues and events in and affecting our state Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. You can be the greatest, you can be the best, you can be the king, come banging on your chest. You can beat the world, you can beat the war. You could talk to God, go banging on his door. You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock. You can move a mountain, you can break rocks. You can be a master, don't wait for luck. Dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. We're going to give a little love, have a little hope, make this world a little better. A try a little more, hard on every more, let's do what we can. Hey, welcome back. This is David Chang with the Art of Thinking Smart, and I'm with my guest, Samantha Wasserman, who for the past 20 years has worked as an executive coach and talent management consultant and she has uh, been talking about what employees what what those that are in the workplace can do to continue to develop their skill set uh, for tomorrow's economy and and now I want to adjust gears a little bit and take it from the employers perspective or managers if, if those are 
manager. And uh, thank you, Samantha. I really, uh, again, appreciate you being on the show. So, okay, I, I'm a boss. I have about you know, 50, 60 employees in the home care side and the financial wealth management side. And we talked about, okay, here's what an employee can do to develop their, uh, if there's no train program, what, what should I do to uh, you know, help my employees develop? What are the resources you know, put into it? I read a study that for every dollar of training I, as an employer, put in, I will get, you know, in some cases, several times back. But a lot of employers, or even entrepreneurs like me, sometimes don't see the value or invest as we should. So I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Sure. Well, first, I'd like to distinguish between uh, the difference between training and other development type activities, experience-based development, things like that. So as a manager and leader of a, a, a business or even a, just a group within a business, one of the things you can do is look at what skills need to be developed, technical skills, um, things that are more tactical in nature. Those are training programs, and you can certainly outsource those things. Those are things that you can um, find agencies to come in and fill that need. So if you have a need for technical training, you're employing a new technology, you're rolling it out, you certainly hire in those experts to come in and, and train your employees. That's a good example of, of training for a skill. Developing people to become managers, that's much more experiential based. So one of the best things that you can do as a manager is to be able to give cross assignments to people and then coach them through those transitions. I think all too often what I see is some of these um, rotational programs. They don't have to be formal, but giving somebody who, for instance, may have a marketing background but wants to learn a little bit more about finance, taking a rotation with a mentor in finance and getting some projects or responsibilities there and having a manager within finance be able to, to oversee the work and, and be able to manage performance. That's a great way to season your employees and get people ready for next level roles. That's a fantastic way to do it. Got it. And so let's say entrepreneur just starting, uh, maybe you can have a budget to hire one or two folks. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what do you recommend that, you know, they have resources. I guess in some cases, everyone's got to wear different hats. Uh, mm -hmm. How, and, and part of your background is not only do you coach individuals, but you coach groups. And group yeah. dynamics, I mean, play such an important role. I've had that issue. <laughs> Once the group dynamics come into play, then how do you suggest, you know, companies move forward? Um, well, group dynamics, generally speaking, need to be addressed, well, I should say this, group dynamics that are getting to a place where there's irresolvable conflict, where there's tension and conflict, the best course of action is to hire an objective outsider to come in and, and help the leadership team uh, or the working team resolve that conflict, because that person is neutral and they probably should have some expertise in conflict resolution and, and team building. So that's probably the smartest thing um, in, in terms of addressing a, a team dynamic that's, that's not productive. Um, as far as uh, developing up people in a team environment, um, certainly uh, there are informal structures that can be put in. You mentioned just having a couple of employees. One of the best things to do in smaller teams um, that are even disjointed teams is, is to really find out what people want to learn, mm. what ways in which they want to develop. People don't come to work just to do a job. They want they have certain aspirations, and if that you can get those people to articulate what those are, you're better able as their manager to meet those needs. Mm -hmm. And you're probably better able to hold on to those people over time. And on that, you know, I probably have used quite a few uh, sites to uh, recruit or hire employees. And one of my favorite business books is Jim Collins, Good to Great. And you know, one yeah. of his you know key principles are you got to have the right people on the bus and also the right people in the right seat and the wrong people right. off. <laughs> and where do you find, in your experience, how do you recommend somebody find the good team uh, uh, for uh, somebody who's in the workplace? that they can find a company they fit in and somebody who's a manager can hire somebody that's a good culture fit. I think culture is such a big important thing that mm -hmm. people only look at the skill but not if they're going to fit in well with that organization. Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting. Um, I think objectively two ways. Employee referrals 
of people that are already within a company. I know in technology, this is huge. Mm. And I recently, believe it or not, went through an interview process at Amazon.com. Mm. This was last year. Um, and I believe that th they have a very strong culture. And if I'm to use them as an example, um, one of the things that's very, very important is employee referrals, so. knowing that people internally know, get along, and like being with and working with the other individuals that they're bringing in and recommending to the organization. I think that that is one very informal way that employers can go about doing that. I would say a more formal approach that, that works best is when you're interviewing, there's something called behavioral-based interviewing. And there's a lot of consulting firms that have made a lot of money based on, on um, developing methodologies, but it's very simple. When you're interviewing people, you ask for examples. Hmm. If you if you want somebody that's a problem solver, that's a creative problem solver, you ask questions such as, uh, tell me the last time you solved a problem, what was the outcome, give me specific examples of the steps that you went through to do that. And you're really going to be able to get to a level of granularity in terms of how they go about it and what skills they actually have. I think some people aren't trying to lie on their resume or trying mm. to overstate their experience. I think they actually believe that they have that experience <laughs> simply because they don't have anything else to measure the, their own skills. You against, saw a YouTube video. Uh, because, <laughs> because how would they know? Right, right. right. So um, it's good to give people the benefit of the doubt. But when you can really get to that level of granularity through examples, that's where you know whether you have somebody with the right capabilities and where they should actually be sitting on the bus. <laughs> you know, I, I, this is great. The, I like that for examples. Uh, and what companies have you seen or you've advised the coach that have done it right, a good example, and some companies that you've seen, uh-oh, you know what, they're, they're not doing a good job, uh, just kind of to compare and contrast. Well, what's interesting is the companies that, that I've seen not do a great job, there's a lot of internal conflict mm -hmm. about what people are looking for. Oh. So in other words, um, the, the parties that need to decide on, on who gets hired in aren't well aligned. They're not well aligned with their purpose. They're not well aligned with what they're looking for. And um, in many instances, they're just including way too many people in the, in the decision-making process. Um, I know that I've uh, been through some, some interviews, not many of late since I have my own company, yeah. but I watch other people go through interviews. And the way that it's done is you walk in the door at 8 o'clock in the morning and you're done at 6 and every... 30 to 45 minutes, you're switching people. And it's not a good way to get a glimpse into what somebody has to offer, nor is it a good way for, for, for people to be able to make good decisions. Hmm. So um, I think the ready, fire, aim right, <laughs> model right. is something that I see gets, gets in the way. Um, the companies, I think, that do it very well is I think that they take their time. Um, now, sometimes this can't, uh, sometimes people need to be, um, be hired quickly, and I understand that, but I think by, by the people that need to make the decisions to hire, by getting aligned up front mm. and not waiting for the group decision after the, the potential employee leaves, I think it's it, things can be uh, much better. Um, it can be a much better process for everybody involved. And when you're saying alignment, you're saying alignment on the capabilities of this person. It's almost creating here's mm -hmm. uh, John Doe, and we would like John Doe to have these skills and, and this type mm -hmm. of uh, you know how this person will fit in the company. Right, and 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 gain agreement on that almost in advance so that everyone's looking to fit a common purpose. Mm. The companies that struggle, they don't get that agreement up front. And it does it, it can never be 100%. Sure. But sure. anywhere between 70, 80% agreement of what they're looking for and to fill a common purpose, that's what's important. Got it. And then kind of going back out to big picture view, now that we've kind of mm -hmm. gone into, you know, the, the granularity of how interviews and how to find people, uh, what do you see as a trend? So here we are in uh, 2017, and and I mean, you know, technology is just rapidly just changing. I mean, our mobile phones now. Uh, I think the, this year is the first year that mobile ads 
uh, will now surpass TV ads. So we're going right. to continue to see that trend. Uh, what do you recommend or what do you see the future looking like and, and how do both employees and employers, managers prepare for it? Okay, that's a great, that's a great, um, that's a great question. I would encourage people not to get caught up in the now. I think especially with technology, there's new features and everybody's the next release of software and everybody gets excited about what's happening in the near future. What I'd really think about is what's going to be needed Where's the demand in, in, in the distant future? And in technology, that means, what, two to three years at the most? So cybersecurity. I was reading um, um, an investor report recently that um, the demand for cybersecurity, uh, the market for it is, is somewhere in the $8 billion range wow. right now. Um, so think about the skills that are needed. Think about, the, watch the news, see the breaches going on. Um, and understand this is where critical problem solving comes in. You've got very experienced criminals out there trying mm -hmm. to hack into pretty sophisticated systems and they're, and they're quite successful. So where's the logic behind that? You know, um, it was interesting. Mark Cuban made a remark. I think he was having an interview recently, uh, in Q1 and he would said something to the effect that coding is on its way out. So don't be thinking about coding, hmm. be thinking about a liberal arts degree. Got it, <laughs> got it. And where I would actually take that a step further is, I'm not sure that I would agree with that in all situations, but where I would take that a step further is the people that I think of when I work, because I worked in technology firms. When I lived in San Francisco, I have technology clients now. I have a lot of biotechnology clients to so the scientific um, organizations and the people that are most equipped to deal with solving complex problems while using and developing technology, these people were philosophy majors. Hmm. They weren't, they weren't uh, engineers by training. They actually know how to solve problems. So that's where I would take it a step further. And I would think about um, looking into the future as to where, what the world is really going to need. And so I'll, I'm placing my bets on cybersecurity. Got it. And, and we only have a, a few seconds left before we have okay. to end it. Uh, uh, for last words, you know, we were able to get a uh, executive coach for you know, top executives, uh, you know, 30 minutes here. <laughs> okay. Last closing words that you say, you know, last words of advice for, for those of us out there. Sure. Something very important that I find um, when companies promote people from within, um, I think they do a decent job of identifying good people and they, at times, especially during growth phases, can promote people well. What they don't do is support people through those transitions to mm -hmm. ensure successful leadership skills get built. And that is one thing that whether you can find good mentors inside or hire external coaching um, to, to get somebody with some expertise specifically in transition coaching, I think that that's a wonderful idea. It will set you up for success so much further down the road over and beyond everybody else. Got it. Well, thank you so much, Matt. I really do appreciate it. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And I want to thank uh, those of you for joining us. And again, uh, you can catch us again uh, every Thursday at 11 a.m. Hawaii time uh, for our next show on the Art of Thinking Smart. Thank you again so much.